Okay, let's begin. Okay, so good afternoon everyone. I'm Jaslyn Bay, co-founder of Blesson Consulting, also one of the organizers of this webinar today. So on behalf of Blesson Consulting and Nouns International, I would like to extend a very warm you taking time off your very busy schedule to join us today. Okay, so this is the agenda of today, whereby we'll have each speaker to introduce themselves as well as the company before we go into the panel discussion. So before I begin, I would like to share some housekeeping rules. So firstly, please turn off your audio and video throughout the discussion. I know some of you may be very excited to you know, ask any question. You can feel free to post it at the chat box. Uh, we will discuss it during the open discussion. Okay. So you can also ask uh, your switch off, switch on your you know, audio and video on during the open discussion session if you want to interact with the speakers uh, and you know, ask any question with your feedback, stuff like that. Okay, so please note that the session will be broadcasted live on multiple pages on uh, Facebook. So we will greatly appreciate if you can share with your peers who may benefit from this session. Okay, so today we are very excited to have uh, Mr. Mr. Craig Howe, a regional senior consultant from NAUS International, and also my colleague Paddy Tan, uh, co founder of Blaston Consulting, to share with us whether companies should expand their business in times uh, of crisis like this. Okay, so our objective today is to find out how you as an entrepreneur, a business owner, HR personnel, uh, a management team can actually prepare yourself for any you know, upcoming uh, opportunities uh, during this pandemic disruption, stuff like that. Okay, so we are also on a complimentary consultation for you if you want to ask any question that is customized to your needs. So you may ask, uh, you know, that's some consulting. You can speak to us uh, if you want to find out more about how to do business in Southeast Asia, how to grow your business, or need you know, general advice on how to scale your business. So all these can be answered uh, by us. So you can put a slot by scanning the QR code over here. Okay, so you may also arrange a session with NAUS International uh, if you would like to uh, seek advice on recruitment strategies, uh, find out more about the talent markets in multiple countries that NAUS is operating in. So he, he can share more later uh, uh, where are the countries that uh, NAUS International have print on. Okay, and you, know, you can find out more about opportunities of how to hire good talent, stuff like that. So I'll leave this slide here for around maybe one minute uh, for you to scan and, and make your bookings. If you have any problem with that, uh, feel free to ask any question at the chat box. You can address that. Okay, so we will show this screen later and as well as send you uh, an email on this. If you wish to sign up, you can also uh, you know, scan the QR code over there. Mm -hmm. So now, before we begin, let us welcome our speaker to give an introduction about themselves as well as their company. So we'll start off with Paddy from Batstone Consulting. So Paddy, please. Yeah, hi. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, thank you everyone for taking the time. Uh, to attend uh, these uh, 90 minutes of uh, discussions and talk. Okay, uh, so let me just do a very quick introduction of uh, what is uh, Blackstorm Consulting. Uh, basically, we are based in uh, three countries. Uh, headquarters is in Singapore, and uh, we have offices uh, in uh, Bangkok, Taiwan, and uh, Malaysia was supposed to happen a couple of months ago, but uh, most of us are still working from home. So uh, it seems like this thing is probably going to be delayed until uh, probably later part of the year. Uh, Blackstone Consulting, we are actually a boutique uh, growth consultancy firm. Uh, we do a couple of things. Uh, we specialize in uh, crisis management. We help companies to grow, and especially when uh, companies want to enter into Southeast Asia. So what happens is that uh, we help them to uh, expand their businesses uh, in a very rapid format. So you typically, we run it almost about 100 days uh, with the moment they land, and uh, almost immediately, we actually start uh, you know, uh, connecting up with our partners, doing strategy planning and, and then even you help them to do uh, uh, executions or so. Uh, we have been around for almost about two years. Uh, yes, actually been spun off from uh, our other parent company. Uh, yeah, next. Yeah, so uh, these are a couple of things that uh, we, especially now uh, with this uh, pandemic uh, going around uh, globally, a uh, couple of other things that we have been uh, focusing a bit more, uh, which is, uh, if you look on the slides itself, 
uh, we basically help a lot of companies uh, to overcome the business challenges, especially when we are talking about uh, they may have uh, internally the uh, capability, they may not have uh, sufficient uh, manpower, uh, where, which is why we work with uh, partners like Create, where they, uh, you know, they help to bring in uh, good quality talents. And then uh, what we do is that we actually help uh, to put them in place together with the uh, uh, other uh, colleagues and then uh, help them to expand the business uh, rapidly. And also at the same time, uh, for companies, like especially overseas, when they enter into Singapore, they may also want to look into other parts of Southeast Asia. So this is also the kind of things that uh, we actually help them to expand through uh, the various offices uh, that we have. Thanks. Next. Yeah, so uh, our offerings are a bit uh, interesting. So we cover uh, from uh, business growth, uh, market entry, and even uh, transformations. Uh, if you look on from the top column itself, uh, there are a couple of ways that uh, actually uh, business uh, know how to scale up. But at the end of the day, uh, you probably want to go for someone to actually have a bit more experience on that. So which is why myself and uh, my co-founders, uh, we did have uh, some experience. Uh, well, uh, in fact, among the whole bunch of them, I'm actually the oldest. Uh, I've I been uh, doing a lot of uh, investment. Uh, I exited a couple of times, uh, make some money. So, and also uh, help to grow teams up. And then after that, from there, we, where we scale them. So uh, our focus is actually very much uh, quite straightforward. Uh, we cover a very comprehensive uh, strategy. Uh, we are not your typical, uh, you know, those uh, big consultancy firm where it's just, uh, you know, a, a lot of theories. Uh. So ours is uh, actually more of actions uh, than uh, theories. So a lot of things like strategy, uh, operations, finance, and even people, uh, we don't just talk, we actually plan the whole thing. And then uh, we also help to do the executions uh, together with the team. So if for situations like now, where the uh, maybe some of the some of them have headquarters, like for example, we have a handful of clientele actually from Taiwan uh, and also from uh, Hong Kong, where they want to uh, enter into Southeast Asia. But uh, the problem is that now since they can't fly, so what we do is that uh, we have our own people and we execute together with them on the remote basis. And uh, <clears throat> the format is that we cover a couple of things. Uh, we go from consultancy, where we actually do an engagement. Uh, it can be a one-to-one, -one, from the top management all the way to the last guy. And uh, we also uh, create programs. Programs like uh, we provide our trainings. It can also be a one-to-one -one trainings, uh, matchmakings, and even also uh, working closely with them on the uh, certain market uh, executions. Uh, last but not least, we also provide learning resources, uh, especially when uh, there are situations where uh, sometimes one to one versus uh, one to five or one to many on the workshops depends on the uh, kind of uh, no, uh, learning progress. So this is also we customize and cater to them uh, to ensure that everybody actually no, not only know how to uh, learn about the theories but also know how to do the execution together with us. Next. So uh, yeah, uh, at the same time uh, we're also very proud that uh, we are founding member of uh, MB Alliance. Uh, MB Alliance is basically interconnected uh, regional platform that we actually link up our uh, various entrepreneurs uh, with a network of experts. We have a couple of partners uh, from uh, Taiwan, uh, Singapore, Malaysia, Hong Kong, Thailand, a whole bunch of them that actually covers quite a wide uh, range of uh, expertise from uh, branding and uh, positionings all the way to management, to legal and finance. And especially, you know, if you're entering into countries uh, like in Southeast Asia, uh, legal, the operations, there may be uh, very different ways of uh, executions and may very different ways of uh, understanding uh, how all these uh, will probably have to, uh, you know, uh, be executed perfectly. And especially you can't have uh, one sale uh, or a, a simple solution to actually be catered to different markets. So this is where we come in uh, together with our MB Alliance. Thanks, next. Okay, uh, but this picture may be a bit small. Okay, uh, we work with uh, quite a lot of uh, companies uh, from big brands like uh, Lenovo, Sharp, uh, to startups, uh, even to with uh, government agencies like ITRI, uh, E3, Triple I's from uh, Taiwan, or even uh, with uh, like E27, where we are the uh, official consultants for uh, E27 here in Singapore. Uh, we also work with banks like uh, FinLab and also uh, many other uh, corporate partners, especially in terms of the corporate innovations and uh, especially even uh, like now, where we are also helping a lot of companies to do internal and external growth structuring also. Next. Yep. So uh, let me just uh, pass the, pass the so-called mic 
to my partner, <laughs> Craig here. Okay, Thank you, buddy. So we're here introduction from Craig right now. Yep. So, so I'm Craig uh, from from Nice Consulting. Um, I think if you could go to the next slide, Justin. Yeah. So Nice Consulting, we, we're a, a global, we say, executive search consultancy, uh, which is established in Paris uh, ten years ago. So we we've since grown to focus on supporting growing uh, high growth technology companies recruits. Um, out of our Paris office originally, we've since grown to cover Dubai and Singapore. Um, but we essentially work in a global remit, so we, we typically support uh, more regional, uh, with obviously Europe for our Paris office, Dubai looking after the Middle East and Africa, and then Asia from our Singapore office here. Um, essentially what we do is, is help sort of senior managers, uh, CEOs, general managers of the region, um, recruit and obviously plan their talent strategies for their respective markets. Um, typically from our client base, we actually work with, I would say about 80% of our clients are Western technology companies growing into Asia, um, either establishing their first or second hires in the region, and then helping them expand into new countries as they, they get more success here. Um, the other 20% of our clients that we tend to work with are Asian companies growing outside of the home market. So a good example would be companies in Singapore that are expanding into new locations in Southeast Asia or heading into North Asia or essentially North Asian companies coming down into Southeast Asia. Um, so we have a, a team of 30 consultants globally, which we, we tend to say sort of that the value that we add to our clients is very much, we understand that the high growth markets that they're in, we have uh, cultural nuances. <coughs> Excuse me. I guess the awareness of the different cultural nuances in in Southeast Asia and Europe and and the Middle East, um, so that we can provide. Whilst we're doing the groundwork from Singapore, for example, we can do the the groundwork, and then we can provide advice on how Singapore differs to Vietnam, how it differs to Thailand, how it differs to Taiwan, Hong Kong, for example. So, we typically say that we we help sort of from from that perspective of providing a, a full search process. Uh, what we do is really take time to get a brief from clients when we're engaged and hired for a project. Um, do an extensive market map across the region advice on talent available, the skill sets available, salary, consulting as well, so understanding if the budgets are relevant to the, the talent that they need, um, and then help execute a recruitment process right the way from attracting and extending a brand in the market through to bringing people into the interview process. We do quite extensive screening on the client's behalf and help them with the off negotiations and closing the right hire to onboarding. Um, so in terms of locations where we work, I mentioned it is global. Um, I think a, a good statistic we like to repeat quite a lot is that in, in, in 2019, out of the three locations we have globally, we placed in 38 different countries. Uh, so it's very much that we are very regional, very global. Um, and the proof of, I guess, the work that we do and the quality that we do is really supported in the clients that keep coming back to us for those locations. Um, and that means what I guess what we're trying to do and the way that we differentiate ourselves across from, a, I guess, a lot of other recruitment businesses is that we provide the, the high speeds uh, recruitment service for high growth markets and high growth companies, but in a way that we provide a full search process. So it's very quality driven. It's very focused on search methodology and the ongoing reporting that we provide back to clients. So we feel it, it's, it's better than a, better than a CV broken service, but also sort of a bit more cost effective for the growing startups that we support uh, more than the, the typical uh, executive search firms you might be aware of that uh, are probably sort of 50, 60 years old. So a bit about me, I guess, in terms of the conversation. Um, I, I, I'm British originally, um, but I haven't actually lived in the UK for 12 years. Uh, I moved out originally to Australia in 2008. I spent three years recruiting, or I guess started my recruitment career in Australia, in Sydney, uh, doing a lot of work within the fintech space. And then eight years ago, I moved up to Singapore. Um, so I took more of a regional, regional search process that I was getting a bit conscious that Australia is, is a nice place and very good for a lifestyle. But I think personally, I felt it was a bit disconnected from the rest of the world. Um, so I wanted to get more regional exposure, more global exposure, and moved up to Singapore, which is also close to my family back home as well. So it makes one flight and, and have a bit less time to, to get home. So that was always a bonus. Um, so since my, my eight years in Singapore, I've developed a lot of networks within the, the fintech industry, um, but then joined now at the start of this year, where I was taking a more agnostic uh, technology industry role. So whilst a lot of my business is in the fintech world, we also support a lot of growing tech companies across uh, all, all industries in technology, um, so ad tech, uh, AI, data, um, travel tech, you name it. I guess we, we have clients we've worked in in all sectors of the industry through our team globally. 
And there's, uh, I guess, a bit of an overview of how we've, we've grown our business uh, across the world. So there's obviously more details you can look at our website. So, so it's been a good journey so far, and, and obviously we hope to continue. All right. So thank you both for the introduction. So it's very impressive, great, uh, to hear you introducing yourselves as well as yourself. All right. So we are going into the panel discussion, the topic on should companies continue to expand? All right, let me stop, stop share the screen. So the pandemic has been ongoing for six months. Uh, and now, you know, many businesses are actually looking to keep their, you know, business afloat or even some are even feared to do so and they see their operation lay off their workers, stuff like that. So as we are coming to the last quarter of the year, perhaps we can ask the speaker here today, do you think business should expand their business in times of crisis like this? Should they continue to expand or should they, you know, hold back? So, yeah, can any one of you start off with the question? Yeah, uh, yeah. yeah probably let me, let me just take the first step on it first. Uh. I, I think, uh, well, in terms of crisis, uh, well, since this is actually, especially this is a global crisis, uh, it, it probably level the whole entire playing field for everyone. I, I, I mean, uh, it, it, it almost like everybody is actually now working from home. And uh, most businesses are actually affected one way or another. And uh, while well, it takes a while for some businesses, uh, you know, some businesses to recover, uh, some actually goes on very, very well. You know, it, 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 could, it could have, um, they, some of these businesses probably could not have actually survived uh, if it's without this pandemic. And uh, some of these new businesses are actually born because of this pandemic. Uh, I think end of the day, uh, if you're talking about how to, uh, you know, should, should actually business uh, expand at this moment? I think the answer is yes. Uh, but we probably have to look into a couple of uh, criteria. Let's say, for example, uh, if your business has always been very traditional, okay, has always been very traditional. So the question here would be, uh, are you able to expand? Okay, because uh, you are, you are talk we are talking about expanding it in such manner that when most people are actually um, physically not in contact with each other, but everybody is in contact with each other virtually. So if it's, a, if it's a traditional business, meaning that are you going to have a physical product, physical kind of uh, interaction uh, services? So if that is the case, and if you want to expand it, then it's probably not expand the business in the traditional way. You may actually have to go in into like, you know, uh, selling things or making the service uh, online and uh, having it to have an outreach program to reach uh, customers that couldn't uh, come to you, but instead you go to them. I think this is one of the criteria that we have to look at. The second criteria is also, uh, while during uh, the transitions, let's say for example, you're running a very traditional business and you intend to move up, intend to move upstream. Then you have to ask yourself, the kind of uh, supports that you have, and the kind of employees that you have, uh, skill set wise, uh, do they have? Because uh, it is not so much as, uh, if you're a small little startup, you know, you're a small little uh, SME, I think pivoting will probably make it, uh, allow you to do it quite quickly. But if you're a very big traditional business of like, you know, uh, 50, 100 people, uh, I think the mindset, the resistance level will probably be high. So the transition is always one of the biggest challenge if you want to expand your business. And uh, of course, uh, the, the third one, as I mentioned, uh, will probably be whether is this market sustainable? Uh, because uh, here, here's the thing, uh, you know, probably about a couple of months ago, nobody actually thought about doing customized, uh, customized of uh, masks, your face masks. But uh, now if you look at it, uh, almost everywhere, anywhere, you can see everybody doing some, some form of uh, customizations, some form of personalization. So, so that, that's a short little window that you actually plow into it uh, may probably give you uh, some earnings. But uh, however, if, uh, if you, you happen to evolve your business from traditional business to going to something new during this period of time, but what happened if this market evolve again? Uh, are you able to sustain? I think this is, these are the few questions that uh, personally I could feel that uh, it has to be answered first before you decide uh, how to expand and what to expand. Thanks. Right. So the answer is uh, yes, but you have to be prepared for that and know what you want to achieve when you expand your business. Right. Yes. So, Craig, right. do you have any you know, opinion on whatever uh, Patty is saying? Well, what do you think? Should business you know, expand their business uh, in times like this? <laughs> I'm probably going to give maybe a consulting answer. I think it depends. Um, I think wholeheartedly, I would probably agree with Patty more so than not agree. Um, that's also because I guess if, if they're growing, they're hiring, and, and we're getting projects, so slightly biased in my opinion in that respect. Um, but but I think 
growing for the sake of growing is probably not a good strategy. Um, if you see some opportunity to, to grow, I think you have to take, certainly as CEOs, co-founders, regional directors, really understanding what is, is the market like there, how competitive is it? And it also depends what you mean by growth. Is it is it purely looking at growth from a sales perspective and, and then bringing on salespeople to, to take advantage, like, like Paddy said, of the let's say the personalized mass situation? Um, that's great. Put your your technology in place in terms of e-commerce selling. I think that that's a good strategy. But if it's growing as a new location, that maybe at the start of the year you had the plans to, to open a new country, you've really got to take a step back and I think assess what the impact of that is going to be. Um, can you hire? Do you have the network to really get across the the legal, I guess, constraints of opening up, can you do the process and execute it? Um, I think an example I, I can probably reference is one of our clients that we're working with is setting up out of London to set up a Singapore office. They have plans to execute the hire in August, um, but because they're involved in the, the fintech space, um, there's a bit of uh, AML, KYC regulation that we need to adopt a bit ad- adhere to. Um, Essentially, what happened is that they had to push back their opening of the office by three months because the documents that the lawyers needed were in the office and they were going to get to the office. So I think they could push through. They could have had all their the infrastructure in place mm-hmm. and said, hey, look, we're open. But if a client calls them up, there's nobody physically on the ground to, to service them. So that probably could have been more damaging for the brand perspective if they pushed through it and not had the right, uh, I think the right relationships on board. Um, but uh, yeah, it really depends, I think. Um, and, and understanding what cash flow you would have as well. I think what we've seen from, from our clients is those businesses that are quite stable and have the right reserves in place uh, are probably a bit more well positioned to say, hey, yeah, look, we can do it. There's certainly some opportunity. Um, whereas those that typically need to look at restructuring and, and maybe unfortunately letting go of some staff or, or really cutting back on certain spending, then definitely not right. So. Um, yeah, I think it just depends what, what you're in and maybe as Paddy mentioned if you can pivot your, your business then, then definitely sort of how do you do it take more of an agile risk assessment approach that just just be I guess be confident of, of your own ability to understand your business and your customers your, your own chance to make money and then if, if you feel that at the end of a quick uh, probably quicker risk assessment process it's worthwhile why not I think there's definitely a lot of opportunities to be had here yeah, so since Craig, you mentioned the topic about you know hiring, uh, and you also talk about uh, you have a client who actually um, based in, based in London and you know want to set up office in Singapore. So could I ask also how can company go about international manpower planning at this stage when the situation is actually quite hard to predict? So how, how should they go about that? Yeah, I guess there's various options. Um, I'd say if they're planning as a part of a, a just a plan and it's an idea at the moment to grow, um, then do lots of research, I would say. I mean, talk to, particularly if you're backed by investors, talk to your VC that they're typically going to have networks globally. Um, of course, talk to recruitment consultancies and search, search consultancies that will have people on the ground and, and insights across the region. I guess because it's like both now some black storm um, are really good at providing insights. Um, but I think just just understanding from your business, is it going to result in a hire? If it results in a hire, then you can probably be a bit more specific and say, okay, so internationally, I'm, for example, a business in, in Europe. Um, am I setting up an engineering center? Um, if so, where is the best place for engineering talent in, in Asia? Um, typically you probably find a lot of resources online that might suggest Thailand, uh, I think Ho Chi Minh in, in, in Vietnam, maybe Taiwan, for example. So it's understanding, I guess, where the best talent is available and what skill sets within that range are available. Um, or if you're, I guess, looking at, you need someone on a client facing role, where's your client? I think understanding if, if you're getting Japanese clients, then potentially being based in Singapore might be okay, but it is a lot of face time needed when, when things get back to normal and do therefore need office in Tokyo. Um, so I really, I'd, I'd say it definitely depends on, on, on what their actual goal of international manpower planning is. Um, there's definitely never a sort of one size fits all approach. Um, but I think my, my biggest advice would be talk to your network. Um, I think certainly in this time of, of, of the, the economy where obviously a lot of people don't want to spend consulting dollars, Talk to your VCs, talk to your staff, talk to your friends. Uh, I think everybody probably knows somebody that's working overseas in one different country. Can you leverage that? Uh, social media, I think, uh, Facebook, LinkedIn, there's so much access to people all around the world very easily. Um, 
get a feel for, for, for obviously what the market is saying, what is happening, and really put it into the context of your business, understand what, what you need to achieve, um, and then work out from there that, if, uh, as we discussed just earlier, do you need to execute on that higher now? What is the time over someone coming on board if you do so? Or is it better to wait? Um, and I think see what, what's available from a talent pool and how it fit into your business. Mm, so since we are at the topic of like capturing opportunities, right? Uh, could I ask Paddy, based on your experience, which I believe you have, you know, gone through quite a few rounds of like financial crisis. <laughs> so when is the golden moment to capture opportunities in adult time? Okay. <laughs> you, you, you make it like sounds like I'm very old. <laughs> okay, uh, yeah, the question is, uh, when is the golden, uh, golden moment, right, to capture the opportunity in the downturn? Uh, okay, uh, I, I, uh, uh, I would say this, uh, depending on what positioning are you taking, so let's say, for example, uh, you are a startup, you are a SME founders, you are owners, you are, you know, you are, you are running this business, and uh, somehow, somewhere, the businesses, uh, you know, have been affected. So uh, 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 well, I think the first thing that you need to do is uh, probably on how to survive. Uh, so uh, from our experience, or rather from my experience, uh, after I went through SARS, I went through the Asia financial crisis, I think a lot of, a lot of uh, things that is, uh, is sometimes it's actually better to take a step back. That means uh, instead of uh, looking at your existing business model, looking at the way you have been running for, you know, whether it's for years uh, of, uh, you know, trying to engage, uh, trying to get a business, trying to get money, trying to bring in some revenue here and there, uh, sometimes it may be actually be better to just take a step back and uh, relook the re relook at the whole entire situation. Okay, uh, if let's say if uh, your business uh involve you to meet customers physically, or that you need to meet be at a customer's place physically to do installations, to do testing, to do you know all, all forms of stuff. That means all the activities is uh surrounding around your customer. Uh, if this is the pandemic that's happening and it's probably going to be prolonging then realistically speaking, you have to ask yourself that this may not be something that you actually want to continue. Okay, so ra rather than uh, trying to force yourself, uh, this may actually not you know, something that you, you want to continue because uh, you've got to continue paying people, uh, all your employees and all your staff, and then uh, you're probably going to push through. But uh, the truth is that if you cannot do any form of uh, physical interactions, I think it is uh, best not to take any, uh, a a you know, take a step forward Okay, so uh, I know that it sounds, it sounds a bit weird, like this is a golden moment. So uh, I like to look at the negative part first, because for all you know, this may actually be a pivoting point and it may actually be a, a, a golden moment for you. Because if you are able to look into it and you realize it much earlier than others, uh, you can actually look into how to consolidate and uh, how to turn some of your services or even turn some of your talents or some of your people into something that can be contactless. It can be something that uh, you know you, you don't you don't have to go in. So just imagine, okay. Let's say if you are providing a, a certain services, whether it's a POS or kind of stuff, uh, and you are providing for a, a chain chain store, restaurant chain stores and everything. So instead of uh, since it's not possible, then I as well just pivot it around and say, that, hey, how about we make everything on the cloud base, so that when others are ordering food. You know, there will be there are a lot of uh, brick and mortar that has uh, you know restaurants hawkers that actually has never uh, attempt to do uh, food delivery has uh, never attempt to put their products or items uh, available on the internet for anybody to order. So you may actually use the same understanding, same knowledge that you have, but uh, probably cut down and then just pivot it towards that direction, and uh, that can actually save some business on your own. Okay, uh, this is one. If you are there, it's provided that you are owner and everything. But uh, however, uh, if you are talking about if uh, investors are high net worth individual uh, with some money, uh, I would say uh, a few things that you can always play around with uh, on the golden moment. Uh, one is probably you can look at the shares. Okay, uh, naturally, uh, a lot of companies, you know, they are providing a lot of forecasts. And uh, it seems like as long as uh, this pandemic is going to last uh, longer than expected, then probably a lot of productions, a lot of sales figures, a lot of forecasts, are probably not going to be uh, making it possible. Okay, or even like uh, like recently, uh, like Singapore Airlines, SIA, Air Asia, so a, a lot of uh, airlines, all these, they are all badly affected because uh, their business is taking the plane up in the air. Whether is it to transport people or transport cargoes or whatsoever, somehow, somewhere, uh, if you know, if your, their business depends more on the uh, you know, uh, transporting passengers, then naturally they will be down. So, that also depends on how much of a bargaining power do you want to hold. 
you know, you, 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 if you are investors with some cash, you may want to look into some of these kind of shares and then probably spread it, spread it across diversified. That means uh, rather than just depends on one, uh, probably, uh, you know, just hold it first, make it as a paper loss, and then uh, probably uh, invest in some others that probably go into high gear. Like, for example, uh, almost any logistic companies that we know of are actually uh, experiencing uh, extreme growth. So this can be something that uh, that may be actually the golden moment. Okay. Uh, but however, on the same token, uh, if you're looking into something that, uh, you know, for a slightly uh, short term rather than, uh, you know, on the mid to long term, that you can actually look into some of the startups. Like uh, some of the situations like uh, in Blackstorm ourselves, uh, we handle quite a handful of uh, those kind of situations where uh, BC put in some money, they decided to invest in you, probably instead of uh, giving you 100%, uh, say they're going to put in about 5 to 10 million US dollars, going to put into you. But instead of that, probably they only put in 50% of it. Maybe some, some form of agreement where the payment will come in, the money will come in about 50%, 30%, 20%. And the first lot of 50% had already been issued, given to you. The other 30% is you are supposed to meet a certain uh, milestones. Okay, and uh, sad to say, because of this pandemic, a lot of startups are stuck. They could not deliver, but they need to continue to pay for salaries. They need to continue to operate. But yet, at the same time, they are not able to meet the milestone. So when that happens, uh, no, they, they probably will be running out of cash and everything. And, they, they, and some of these guys may be actually opening themselves up. So if you are running a fintech services, you know, uh, some financial institute, you may actually look into that. This, you may want to service this group of startups. Okay, whether it's a loan or, or is it some form of a financial aid, uh, that can be one way to, to look at it. But if you are, if you are investors or some high net worth, you may actually probably just come in and say, hey, you know, we understand that uh, you already get funded, you already get investors, so our money are not being released to you. Is there some form of uh, structuring that we can actually come in, that we can actually work out to ensure that the instead of giving you money, money, we can actually work out some 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 deals that, you know, like uh, instead of, uh, you know, you get a dollar and spend that one dollar to come up with your products or come up with R&D or come up with hiring. How about if I were to partner with you or I can probably provide you some form of uh, resources that uh, instead of using money to buy, that resources is actually able to help you. And over time, we, I can even help you to open the market in, 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 in where you can't be. So let's say, for example, we are, we, we've been working with one of the clients. Uh, we are working with one of the clients that is based in uh, Singapore. So they wanted to go into Thailand. So they can't. So, and then uh, they're also running out of money. So what do we do? So we identified certain partnerships and then have the partners representing them doing something similar and doing something uh, executions for them in Thailand while they are still here in Singapore doing the R&D. So, so that can be one of the opportunities that we can actually uh, find, find better partners, find stronger partners, and uh, probably even come in with the anger that uh, you can actually benefit uh, both sides in at least uh, in, in, in whether it's in mid or short or long term. Thank you. Yeah, it's actually quite true that many people have been retrenched or uh, get a very deep, you know, pay cut. But on the other hand, I also read an article, you know, yesterday that many people actually quitted from their job despite knowing that the job market is very bad right now. Uh, because, you know, working from home, they realize that their jobs are uh, mundane and, you know, boring. Uh, some actually feel that they are, you know, overworking, stuff like that. Okay, so if you look at the... If, if we look at the job situation right now, as an employer uh, ourselves, we may, we may face a dilemma. So should we offer more or less uh, during this uh, situation? Uh, like in terms of like salary, should we offer more than the market rate or less than the market rate? And when is a good time to actually seek for our top talent? Yeah, could we ask, you know, create uh, for this question? Uh, sure, yeah, that, that's definitely very, very interesting. Actually, I didn't see the article. Maybe you could share that with us, Jessen, as well. Um, but yeah, I think from my perspective, I've probably heard the opposite, is that candidates certainly asking questions of, do I drop my salary? Um, I think in terms of the, the conversation of around, look, I want to change my job or I've been let go and I want to continue working. Obviously, everybody has bills to pay, so it's quite important they have some cash coming in. Um, and people definitely say, look, I, I want to drop my salary. What is the percentage I should do? Quite frankly, my advice is don't. Um, and I think in terms of the the conversation, should you, uh, as an employer, then sort of pay market rate or not? Um, at the end of the day, you know what your business can afford. Um, so it depends as well, I think, what your situation is and how badly you might need somebody. 
Um, and there's always, a, I think, a story that someone somewhere is willing to do something cheaper. So you can always find it if you look hard enough. But I think from, from a personnel perspective, just from a, a moral standpoint as well, um, my advice definitely is to keep paying the, the market rates, um, albeit a bit more if you can, I think, and especially for top talents. Um, it does obviously vary based on the position, the, the person coming into the role, and, and I think certainly what value they can add to your business. Um, so the question really is, yeah, don't get somebody, and, and everybody wants, I guess they want a Ferrari for a 12 hour price range, um, is the analogy. But I, I think the biggest thing to, to consider is that there are, are definitely a lot of people out there in the market looking for jobs. Um, I think with people changing jobs at the moment with, with essentially nothing to go to, it, it's essentially a time that they can pivot their career. Uh, make a career transition that, like you said, Jess, and they're not so happy in their respective roles, respective organizations, it's a great opportunity. I think they can kind of hide under the, uh, I guess, the, the guise of COVID, uh, and that's the reason they change jobs. It's one of those conversations that I think a lot of employers and a lot of recruiters will not necessarily question too much the, the reasons for leaving, um, uh, certainly not question in more in a, a negative way. Um, but I think it's a great opportunity to grow. But Realistically, if you're getting an A player in your team and you're paying them 20% below market rates, they're probably going to be the first person looking out for a new job when the market returns to normal. I guess it doesn't matter when that will be, but if someone comes knocking on their door and, and sees their, their LinkedIn profile, they could get a 20% increase again in two months. Do you want to put yourself in that position where you're rehiring for the same position later on because you were a bit stingy with their salary in the first place? Um, and I think coming with that, it's not just about money um, for both parties. Uh, I mean, for, for me, yes, uh, as, as an employer, you, you can look at your spreadsheet at the end of the month and the accounts and say, look, we, we're getting extra value from this person and what we're saving and what we would have saved or compared to what we would have saved. Um, and look, it's great for us at the moment, but if, if that employee is, is not happy or they, they talk with their friends over in Singapore, I guess a dinner with four or other friends when you can meet in groups of five and uh, when it gets back to normal, obviously they'll, they'll, they'll meet with more people. If they're not happy or, or they're discussing their experience, your name becomes bad in, in the marketplace. You are the company that underpays in the industry compared to your competitors. Uh, and typically people will spend time with, with people like them. Um, so that's so engineers, managers. Naturally, most people obviously have friends in the same profession. Um, can you take that risk as your business to say, well, therefore it's word of mouth marketing, which is definitely is very prominent in Asia. Um, you don't want to put yourself in a position where you are the company with a bad reputation because you're just having to scrimp on a few dollars at the, I guess, one higher. Um, whereas simultaneously, if you are the business that looks after somebody, you provide them with good training opportunities, a good career path, you're very structured with your HR policies and process, the goodwill that that person will give back to you they, they may actually say, I'm happy to take a lower salary because you're giving me X, Y, Z in return. Therefore, I'm going to become more loyal anyway. Um, so I don't think you're looking at it as a pure dollars conversation. Um, it's really around what is this person going to do? Is it a chance that maybe at the, the end of 2021, you give them a profit share if they're a sales individual, obviously better commission strategy. Um, as an engineer, are they helping you generate profit through building an e-commerce platform? Do they then get a share of the business or something like that as well? How much autonomy do they have? I guess when things are more normal, do they get more holidays, more annual leave, better health insurance? There's so much more I think you can talk about. And, and if, if you have to, to pay less, you can structure it differently anyway. Um, but I think definitely my opinion is really no, don't do it. Um, really sort of make sure that your brand is protected and, and when things are normal and, and your business is growing again, you will need to hire people. So uh, don't be, uh, I guess, sort of frustrating yourself and making it hard for yourself in the future because you, you focus in short term right now. Great sharing. I believe this team also uh, would be very helpful for those people who are looking for new opportunities. Okay, not just for the employer. You know, how should you negotiate with the uh, potential employers, stuff like that. Okay, so let's talk about the situation right now in the business world. Okay, uh, we understand that now Century operates in six countries. So uh, is there any interesting insights that you can share with us uh, today? Uh, well, sorry, we have three offices, uh, but we're placed in 38 countries. So okay, <laughs> <I> think, <laughs> all right. <laughs> uh, very, very broad anyway. Um, are, are there any insights? I think uh, looking at it from a global perspective, 
really the, the key things that we've observed, um, and, and this is, as I mentioned earlier, it's very centralized, it's, it's more of a hub model. Um, typically, I think we would, I don't know if it's fortunate or unfortunate being in Singapore, but we're a bit behind the rest of the world initially in the opening up of, of economies. Um, obviously, the situation was that, that I tell this and joke with my family as well, that I would have thought back in back in February, March, Asia was in front of the rest of the world from dealing with the virus. Um, transpired in Singapore, obviously had a, a bit of a blip uh, around April, and we ended up going backwards a little bit in comparison to to other countries. Uh, and I actually use the UK as my like as my my example through through talking to family there. Um, yeah, we, we kind of fell backwards, I think. So, so we've seen in, in hindsight that obviously our Paris office, our Dubai office was able to reopen a lot quicker than our Singapore office. Um, what we've seen is, is typically once governments allow people to come back to the office um, and not work from home, and that could be anything from 50% capacity up to, to full capacity of an office, we, we've typically seen, I think our, our data shows, it's about one month for, for recruitment projects to come in. Um, so it feels that... Once the office is moving properly, um, therefore, I guess, key decision makers are meeting, they're having more collaborative conversations, that they're obviously spending that, that 30 days to, to talk about what they need to do, put plans in place, get sign-offs for, for projects, um, and then they're essentially hiring and coming to us for a lot more projects after a month. Um, so I think that that is a good thing, right? We've seen it get better. Typically, when people are in the office, things move a lot more quickly, um, but I think more isolated from a Singapore perspective I just feel and I don't know if you guys agree at uh, Blackstorm but just since September arrived I feel a lot more confidence uh, as soon as first of September hits that this feels to be a different vibe around the city uh, and around the region through, through conversations it seems, seems to be that as we're progressing through the month it's busier and busier as, as I'm in the office today it's, it's obviously two or three days a week but there's more people commuting on the bus there's more traffic in the city um, I kind of feel that there is a better vibe um, so I think, thankfully, we're moving in the right direction. Um, uh, there's still some industries that, that are obviously affected. Um, I know, for example, a, a client I'm working with in the travel industry supplies a lot of software to, to sort of travel agents. So they're saying, well, there's obviously no idea when things are picking up. Um, and I think news around, like Paddy mentioned, SIA this week, making retrenchments and not really not understanding how their business will grow. It's not great, but I think that they're very optimistic and keeping a plan that look March, uh, I think March 2021 is when they know they need to hire. They have confidence in their products, they will grow. Um, so I guess they're just going to sit it out and strategize how they, they wait for the next six months. Um, but other businesses, I think if you're not directly in travel or tourism, um, then we, we, we're definitely seeing more confidence across um, because the general consensus of what I've had the conversations with is that people can't not do anything any longer. They need to do something, and, and that's really started now. Yeah, thanks for sharing. So, how about Paddy regarding you know, Southeast Asia and you know, other countries in Southeast Asia? What's your view on that? I think that uh, when the uh, lockdown happens, uh, you know, uh, like for example, here in Southeast Asia, uh, Malaysia was actually one of the few countries that actually started the uh, so called equivalent to Singapore circuit breaker, uh, all the lockdowns and stuff like that. Uh, I think the first few months, uh, it, it was pretty chaotic. Partly it's because of, uh, you know, uh, you 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 assume most of us assume that your lockdown is only probably a month or so, and then uh, it started to get extension here and there. Uh, you know, you don't extend the one time, twice, and everything. I think the panic actually starts uh, probably around uh, May, June, July periods, uh, especially in around the months of uh, June and July. Uh, I mean, in, in general, I'm I'm speaking with, with the perspective of uh, those interaction that we had. Uh, is that uh, a lot of business owners start to realize that uh, they have problems uh, getting goods in and out of the country. Uh, they are not able to travel. And uh, the thing is that, uh, you know, uh, I, I'm continuing to pay my uh, employee salary. And uh, not, a lot of them, especially where, as I mentioned earlier, that you need to have uh, so called physical activities and stuff like that. And if the restaurants are shut down, shopping malls are shut down, so everybody got to work from home. Uh, a lot of business owners, uh, especially those in SME, uh, they, they start to go into the panic mode where it is more of like, should I continue, should I not continue? And uh, that, that also allows them to have sort of like, uh, if I were to continue, how long can I actually last financially? Uh, if I were to go and get a bank loan, uh, you know, how much can I get and stuff like that. So, so a lot of people, uh, you know, a lot of business owners start to get panic on this. Uh, similarly, same for uh, startups. Where a lot of startups are like, okay, uh, especially here in Singapore, 
where you know uh, uh well, a lot of startups are, are based here uh, a lot of them are funded around here but uh their market may not necessarily be in singapore itself so if you're looking from a singapore perspective is that a lot of uh, startups or a lot of businesses they actually serve outside of singapore they they, they don't just serve the, the 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 market here they actually serve the out market outside and then at the same times uh coincidentally uh donald trump uh Xi Jinping from China, they 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 just had a huge fight again and again and again and again, and everybody was like, okay, so there seems to be a, a lot of punishment going around, you know, uh, you know, you start slapping on the left face and start slapping on the right face, and uh, a lot of uh, a lot of uh, decisions cannot be made because, uh, simply put, you know, if I were to start manufacturing in China and then start selling to US, I get my 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 taxation is my tax is going to be crazy. And uh, the U.S. side is, uh, seems to be going after a lot of uh, Chinese-based company, you know, that kind of stuff. So it created a lot of uh, uncertainty. And uh, when that kind of uncertainty, I mean, truth to be told, is that uh, the uncertainty is not good. Uh, a lot of uh, a lot of companies have to make a lot of quick decisions. Whether do they want to, uh, you know, do they want to trim down the whole entire workforce? Uh, do they want to, you know, scale down? Or maybe some of the companies actually took the opportunities uh, where, where some of these kind clients actually hired people like us. Uh, took the opportunity to slice and dice the whole entire business and really you know trim down but yet at the same times uh which i agree with craig uh they kept those are uh, they're very talented folks so they keep the talent uh, talents and uh, they probably some of them even like split the company up spin off the company okay i mean everything almost literally virtually so they they, they split the company up they put the pe right people into the right job and then i uh, push it out and at the same time, you know, some of them even uh, because uh, they managed to trim down a, a handful of the workforce, they managed to trim down a lot of operations. Like for example, some of them may be running uh, businesses where you know they need a uh, uh, office, so they decided you know just cut the loss and then uh, that's and then move away so that they can have uh, some some of these savings. And some of these savings can actually be pretty uh, pretty huge. And uh, and uh, also at the same time, some of these uh, business owners have been rather truthful. Uh, no, they told their employees that uh, guys, uh, girls, uh, this is a situation of the world. There's a lot of things that I can handle. So it's either I cut you out, okay, I cut the operation out, I cut the people out, I cut the business out, and everything, and everybody get nothing. Or maybe what we can do is uh, let all strike out together, and you know, uh, start from the top. Uh, usually, usually, I I will I will suggest if you want to cut salary, no point cutting the last guy, okay, because the last guy salary is probably a very small percentage of the top guy. So start with the top guy first, uh, you know, cut the salaries and then uh, really trim it down and then come up with very innovative strategies, come up with very innovative, creative ideas. Don't just think of a higher fire, higher fire. And, uh, you know, the good people will probably not stay. And even if the pandemic is so-called over, okay, uh, the talents, the, 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 those are really good ones. They know their worth because uh, if they can survive this pandemic, I mean, you know, the, the really good one, they probably don't want to work for you anymore because why? It actually shows the true color of the bosses. It actually shows the true color of the management, and it shows the true color of, of everybody. Because, uh, I mean, we, we are stuck in at home for 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 working the longest time. I mean, good that uh, especially I do agree with Craig, especially like now in September. Uh, seems like you no know, lots lots of uh, business activities start to come in and everything. So my my I I don't really have an answer, but uh, what I'm trying to say here is that uh, a lot of activities that had been uh, ongoing uh, evolved quite rapidly. So from the month of uh, June, July, I think this is where uh, a lot of businesses actually start to feel, start to feel that uh, they, they have to make certain decisions. And if you don't make any certain decisions, they're probably going to miss out Q3 and Q4 of that year. And the impact will probably be a full-blown 2021. So so th this is, I think if you ask me, I think it will be more negative than positive. But from the negativity side, you have to do something. Other, otherwise, uh, if you're going to just hold on to it, thinking that this pandemic is going to be over overnight and thinking that everybody is going to be you know, back to normal and as if nothing had happened, uh, I don't think so. I think the, the talented one will probably be sourcing around because by then you may actually discover that, hey, you know, guess what? I've been paid like 7,000 US per month. In fact, I can actually accomplish much more things when I'm at home on a full-time job. But guess what? In between, I can probably you know, identify myself and probably identify that I'm actually stronger in this and than in other stuff. And I can probably find some other jobs that can actually replace these 7,000 and I can probably do much more effectively and efficiently. I think this is the situation that a lot of us are being conditioned now. 
Right. Thanks for sharing. So one last question that we have, you know, I understand Teddy, you yourself is also an investor, also handling multiple like businesses. So from various perspectives, uh, how do you think one should position themselves and market themselves during this downturn? Should they position themselves as, you know, taking a very conservative approach, cutting costs, or should they, you know, present a more positive image that the business is affected? Or some of them, they, the business is actually not affected. So so how should they position themselves? Okay, I, I, I guess your, your question is probably referring more to uh, if you are a business owner, right? To the public, yeah. Okay, to the public. Uh, yeah, social media posts, stuff like that. Okay, uh, I, 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 I'm more of a straight shooter. I'm more of a straight shooter. Uh, what's interesting is that uh, if you try to put on a fake front, okay, I, I know that uh, in the startup ecosystem, in, in the business world, a lot of them say that you know, fake it until you make it. Yeah, but the truth here is that uh, everybody is suffering. I, I, I don't believe no one is actually suffering. But of course, there are some. They're probably because of the, the way they pivoted the business or, or, or probably some, someone like me who always fly. But now I'm actually staying home. So my relationship with my kids are actually stronger. But I think that if you're on the business side, if you need help, you should actually shout for help. You, you know, I, 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 I came across too many of those that is like, uh, okay, so why now then you come to us for help? You, you know, the kind of situation, it could actually save you much more money. So if, if you need help, I think it's okay to announce it. But of course, you have to be smart enough not to not to review every single thing. You must be smart enough that, you know, you must know what kind of help you need. And uh, sad to say, a lot of business owners, the first thing that they always look for is, I need help, I need money. That, that, is, that is probably the solutions to everything, to, to a lot of business owners. Again, it's not wrong, but I, I think there are many ways of getting help uh, if you're not doing well. I think the first step to do is that uh, you have to acknowledge that you need help and what kind of help. So you, you basically, you need to identify your what, where, when, how, you know, the kind of why. Uh, just identify it properly and then uh, just tell the world because why you are not the only one. So if you want to position yourself, if, if somehow you went a bit extreme, telling everybody that, hey, you know, you're doing very well, everything is extremely fantastic, everything is rosy and everything. You are not the only one in social media. You're not the one who's listening. You have your other colleagues and everybody who are in the situation together with you. It was like, how in the world? I thought we are actually doing a retrenchment. How in the world is our company doing well? I, I, I think, I think the, the, it just, just, just speak the truth. Tell everybody that, hey, I need help. What kind of help do I need? Don't be surprised. That, that, that is a, these are the kind of situations where you can actually bond better. This is also the kind of situation, the environment where you get better partners. You get stronger colleagues. I, I think this is how it, 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 it works. So let, let's say, for example, uh, like, uh, like uh, some, sometime in April this year, uh, just a couple of days before the pandemic uh, actually happened, uh, I, I was, I was, uh, I was on, on, a, on a project. Uh, I was on a job, or rather on a project, okay, uh, to support a, a company, a health tech company in uh, Hong Kong. So here's the thing. O on the front, everything looks perfect. But the moment you enter, then you realize, hmm, actually there are actually a lot of things, much more things that, that you no, know, it could have been better if you just be upfront. You know, whether are you the CEO, COO, anybody, you know, if you had just be very upfront and say, guys, things are not doing well. Okay, uh, we need this, we need this, and then we need to prioritize. And when that happens, I think it it, it makes the direction very clear. It allows everybody to have an idea. Of, okay, so here's the thing. The company is not doing well because of various reasons. And pandemic is usually the number one top reason now. If it's not doing well, is there any other things that we can come in to help? So uh, you'll be surprised that some of the colleagues that had been working with you for the longest time, you sort of stereotype that he or she actually is strong in this particular skill. But somehow, sometimes in a certain crisis, okay, uh, some people will just shine much better than others. I think the positioning is always, if you're doing good, Great. Okay. Keep it to yourself. Help others. But if you're not doing fantastically well, ask help. There, there, there is nothing, there's no shame for asking help. But of course, if, if you got the, you know, if you got your help, please do pay it forward. I, I think this is the way of uh, helping, especially when everybody is, you know, is, 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 is suffering under this uh, pandemic. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks for the sharing. So, great. In the perspective of uh, employer, when we talk about employer branding, 
how do you think uh, employers should actually position themselves to uh, potential hire staff like that? Yeah, I think I definitely agree with Paddy. Um, be honest. That, that, that's the key thing. Um, <clears throat> I think a bit of a running joke that I have with, with some of my recruitment friends is that you look at a lot of job adverts, particularly LinkedIn and, and the career sites around Asia or globally, I would say, written by recruiters. It's always an excellent, exciting, fantastic opportunity, um, which is a bit tedious. Um, I, I think it's just lack of inspiration and lack of understanding clients how the market businesses. But there's, I think within that, obviously, it's a bit of a running joke between, between me and my friends, but... The funny thing is that every business, if you ask a recruiter, is market leading as well. If you ask, uh, I guess, a leader, that they do say that we're market leaders, we, we have an exciting opportunity. Uh, I think candidates are now seeing through that. I think a lot of people, when they're applying for jobs, a bit of fatigue in it as well, right? If, if every job opportunity is exciting, why do they need certain skill sets? Um, if the business is, is, is a market leader and, and a high performer, why are they recruiting a transformation specialist or a sales director? Um, I'm not saying, for example, go the opposite way and really sort of put everything out and a dirty laundry on, on social media. But I think in the process, be more realistic. Um, certainly where we come in as well and can help sort of clients advise on their, their go to market strategy from a recruitment point of view that whether they have a presence or not, I think it depends as well that if they're a well-known household business, then I think people like, let's say, Apple, Google, Facebook, probably don't need any introduction when, when they're recruiting. But if it's a smaller business with, with 10, 15, 20 employees in, in Asia and not many people have heard of them, how do you present a business first and foremost? Um, I think being quite objective around what they do, what the business is, what stage of growth they're at it is the best way. Um, but I guess typically you're hiring if, if, if they're growing anyway, right? So, so naturally you can talk about the positives and, and their, their plans and strategy. Um, but I think if you're talking to people within the business, um, definitely being honest and transparent is, is the best way. Um, it comes down to the word of mouth conversation that I would say that we referred to earlier in the conversation. If, if somebody one minute has a conversation and it could be an appraisal, it could be just a, a casual Zoom coffee, for, for example, and the founder says, great, you know, the business is, is doing really well, we're not going to make any cuts, we're all, all okay. And then the next Monday morning, there's a, a conversation of retrenchments or salary reductions. That's going to leave a bit of taste in, in the employee's mouth. Whether they're, they're, they're retrenched or not, or they're affected, uh, I think if everybody puts themselves in their shoes, that, that one minute everything seems okay and, and the next minute it's not, you, you feel betrayed. I think naturally you would feel betrayed and, and I guess starting to distrust the loyalty or the, I guess the honesty of, of your, your seniors. Um, so I think definitely as a, a manager, you've got to be saying, I mean, obviously be careful with what you, you want to share, but I would say, and I think having had conversations sort of directly with people in the same, same situation, if, if a company says that this is where we are, we are struggling a little bit, we need to reduce salaries, um, this is our plan, we've got essentially six months of cash flow left at this level, people will, will use that information and make a decision themselves. Um, I think some people and stories I've heard of is that people are not prepared to take a salary cut and they will resign themselves anyway. If they, they feel the business is not for them, they feel the business is not going where they want it to go, but they're not prepared to, to dig in and support the business as a team, naturally they'll, they'll move on anyway, I think, and they'll be turned over. But I think other people that will, will maybe discuss it, they'll go home and, and chat with their spouse, their partners and, and say, well, this is the situation. I really like the business, I believe. After the pandemic, we were onto a good thing. We've got lots of projects, lots of exciting support. Can we live as a family, for example, with a reduced salary for six months? If it doesn't get better, let's take a call. But let me dig in, let me focus, and, and hopefully I'll be in a better position in six months' time. I've got a job. Some income is better than no income. And I believe in a business, therefore I'll grow. Um, and I think if, if – a manager has that transparency and puts the decision in the employee's court, puts the ball in their court, then I think naturally everybody will be stronger. Uh, as a manager, obviously some people will leave, so therefore you've achieved your objective of saving some cash. Um, but you know the people that are sticking around are the people that really want to stick around and they're there to support your vision. Um, so I definitely think so that the transparency is, is the best policy. Thank you today uh, for the very insightful sharing. Thank you, the speakers, for that. So now we are into the open discussion. So if you have any question, feel free to share at the chat box or you can always, you know, on the video, 
and your audio and you know speak out your question. Let's give everyone uh, maybe a few minutes to you know type down the question or on their videos and audio. Okay, we have one question coming in. What are the risks that businesses should take note of if they wish to enter a new market during this pandemic situation? So for those people who actually decided to go ahead to expand, what are the risks that they should take note of? Okay, uh, I can probably answer this. Um, maybe uh, Craig, you, you can you, you can uh, come come in if uh, you know if, on the if there are any gaps. Uh, okay. Uh, don't mind. You just repeat the question again. Uh, I I I think there was uh, some lagging earlier. Yeah. What are the risks that businesses should take note of if they wish to enter into a new market during this pandemic? Period. Okay. Uh. Yeah. So. Uh. I. I break it down into three three parts that uh we can look at. I think uh most importantly is that uh financial first. Let's start off with financial. I mean, if it's on any other day, I'll I'll probably take it as uh you you could have already have uh sufficient cash uh for you to expand into another market. Uh, when we say another market, it can be defined as another vertical, another industry, or it can be defined as uh entering into another market of another country. So that kind of stuff. I think the first thing that we probably have to look at would be financial. Uh, why? Uh, you know, if, if you watch the, the 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 TV show Games of Thrones, uh, winter is coming. You know, this kind of stuff. Huh? So, so my my only concern will be uh, financially, are you okay to support? Okay. Uh, because uh, well, I won't say history, but the past data has shown that uh, countries had uh, or even cities had been opening, shutting down, opening, shutting down a couple of times. So and uh, well, it's either you 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 know you you probably continue to see all this until something can actually come, some cure comes in. So why financial? Because here's the thing: if you're, especially if you're entering into another country or another markets where you're not very uh, familiar, okay, where there may be even things like that you require you to have uh, localizations or understand the whole entire market. So if you are running it and if you're trying to do it yourself. Then uh, the first and foremost is that you meet, you got to make sure that you have uh, sufficient cash to fight on multiple front. Okay, why? The last thing that we do not want is that uh, while you are trying to enter into another market, uh, your headquarter actually get hit by uh, another shutdown. And uh, you know while, while things so-called get back to normal, and then uh, you got hit again with another shutdown, or that uh, you realize that even uh, I mean uh, I mean just just in case. One or two of your colleagues actually got the virus, and everybody had to be quarantined or something like that. I think financially, you have to make sure that you do have the financial means to be able to sustain a, a, a long, a long war, a long battle. Because when you're trying to enter into the market, uh, and, and you, you are not talking about entering in a nice way. You are probably entering into a market where there may be a lot of other competitors may be blocking you, may be defending uh, their turf. So this is uh, number one that you need to look at. Uh, number two is uh people, okay. People can be uh, again uh, two types of uh, two groups of people that you need to handle. Uh, the groups of people that they are well trained enough to enter into a new battle, into a new market. Okay. Uh, why? Because uh the either the market is consolidating or the market is actually uh expanding. Because uh, if you do not have uh no the the right people and then to put them on the right job, you may actually just do what a lot of other companies are always make the make the mistake, which is always uh, identify a market, send the COO there, send the CEO there, and then uh, just, just visit a couple of times, sit down there, and then hopefully something will actually stick onto the wall. Or maybe even hire a local and then uh, get them trained up. Uh, I, I think this is this may work if you are allowed to travel, and this may work if you don't have to be quarantined. You know, probably when you before you reach a particular country, you, you, you got to do your test. And then when you reach that country, you probably got to go through 7 to 14 days of quarantine. And then you come back again. I don't know how many trips can you make, but I think going up and down 14 days each is probably 28 days. And that is as good as uh, gone for the rest of the year. So I think the right people to have is uh, probably, uh, if possible, try to have people that are already on the ground. Uh, whether, whether you're going to pay them, you're going to hire them, whatever, uh, they should be the right people who is able to do things fast. They means fast with showing results and everything. Why? Because uh, the last thing that you want is that the two markets that you're already, uh, the, the market that you're already in and the market that you want to enter, okay, get shut down again. Okay, and when that happens, it's as good as uh, I'm hiring a whole bunch of people and a whole bunch of people are not doing anything. 
and then all of us are still sitting and waiting and that cash could actually kill you you know the burn rate could actually kill you because you suddenly increase your burn rate multiple fold okay and uh and uh lastly will probably be your product okay i mean i mentioned that there are three things uh i think the last thing will be probably your product uh here, here's a very interesting thing uh because of this pandemic i think all of us know that are uh, getting a item a to item uh sorry uh one i one single item from point a to point b will, will 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 probably cost you a lot or probably cost a lot of waiting here and there so so that is also something that you probably have to uh take note of uh, are you going to bring the whole entire product the same product and then go into the market because uh you may actually require uh productizations you may actually require localizations and you need to have a very strong strategy to wrap around the whole entire thing like for example some of our clients out that we have are from the taiwan uh when they want to enter into southeast asia uh some of them make the mistake of uh hey you know uh, my product is already in uh, chinese okay in traditional chinese or i can even come up with simplified chinese let, let me just save some of this money instructions uh, you know, even the video the training everything I, I just save all this money and then just ship it over and i sell it cheaper so here, here's a problem okay customers uh can be pretty petty if, if it doesn't work once it doesn't work twice they will probably not come back to you anymore so 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 some of this actually works on that and thinking that hey you know uh let, let me just do whatever it is the most minimum and then i enter into the market and i i try to figure things out along the way i i think a, a lot of things is that uh, you probably have to really spend enough time to look at the whole products and uh, don't just you know come in to enter and expect that uh, the thing will stick like some of the case uh some of the some of the uh some of the cases that we work with uh going back to this a uh, couple of taiwan uh clientele is that uh they they were like hey okay, uh if we enter into southeast asia we'll probably never will never be able to beat uh the make in china products because uh, they are cheaper they are better and they are probably in a huge abundance so for a uh, taiwan make product uh you know in terms of pricing in terms of uh, delivery in terms of quantity volumes and all this uh we may lose out but we will definitely have higher better quality so when uh so when some of them try to look into that they would they they had the, they 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 use the mindset of they they sort of like stereotype themselves and put themselves into a corner thinking that okay this is the assumption so when that kind of assumption happens uh when you try to enter into the market then you only need to realize that okay i'm actually making a lot of mistake and it will probably cost me more to undo so i i would say the very first few things uh, if you really want to enter into the market i mean to to answer to that question itself uh you probably need to look into just three keywords very simple three keywords look into uh first of all the allocations okay uh no do enough feasibility studies do enough you uh, know the kind of potential the feasibility the risk the financial and every single thing and and when that happens then you decide how are you going to land who is going to help you to land okay so once you land the whole entire you know your your business and everything okay how are you going to grow so that's the third one which is growth so then this is the part that you you, you really have to localize it and and uh, I I I know I'm from Blackstone but uh, but this is what we work on. So since you are physically not possible to travel here but we are physically here and you want to enter into Southeast Asia market uh, we have the people to rapidly do it for you within 3 months 4 months 100 days and then you see the results and it's definitely still better than trying to undo all the mistakes that uh, that you've tried to do it yourself also without sufficient uh, experience. Thank you. You no, know, thanks for the long answer to the question. <laughs> okay, so we have another question uh, from Erickson. Uh, he actually asked it at, on Facebook. So with limited business, other than the expected salary, what do you think business owners can do to keep up the interest of the talent to stay with the company? So this question is directed to Craig. So... Yeah, thank you. That's yeah. a very good question. Um, I could actually see it coming in, so I was in a bit of preparation, thankfully. <laughs> so, uh, I think one that has uh, it could potentially be quite a long answer. Um, I'll try and be succinct, but I think the key phrase that I jotted down was, was be human. Um, I think really considering, uh, as I mentioned maybe earlier in the conversation, and understanding that some businesses uh, probably don't have a, a lot of money to, to spend. And I think Ericsson mentioned that, that obviously that there's limited business coming in and limited sales. Don't try and incentivize people, don't try and incentivize people with cash. Um, I think really it's just understanding who your employees are. 
Um, I think go back to your conversations when you first hired them. Who are they as a person? Who are you as a person? Um, uh, and get to know them, I think, again, perhaps with people being fragmented, uh, certainly across cities and also regions and not having that face time that you, you would have had normally. Um, I would say just, just get them engaged again or, or get engaged with the people, understand their situation, um, really be conscious, I think, of, of understanding uh, first and foremost how are they dealing with the situation, uh, what is their personal situation like as well. Um, are, are they, for example, having a family? Do they have to work with kids at home? How old are their kids? What's the situation? Um, and I think understand that first, really sort of see where they're struggling. Um, I think if somebody is struggling with a particular element of being productive at work, why is that? When is that? Is that that, that they have a school run in the morning or they have sort of, uh, I guess, sort of split in the work time with their spouse as well and therefore they have to do half a day productivity the rest of the work in the evening when the kids are in bed? Um, I think just understanding that and, and getting to know them on a deeper level will help. Um, and as we discussed earlier in the, in the conversation, be transparent about where you're at with the business. Um, I think understanding obviously what you can share, what you can't share, but let the two conversations align. Uh, you probably as a business owner are frustrated in, in, in some respect that you might just need to talk to somebody. Uh, and I think other than, than obviously your, your, your close network that you have outside of work, yeah, that's great. But I think your, your business network is really important as well. Um, as Paddy mentioned previously, they'll have ideas, they'll be able to help you. Um, and then I think so once you understand where the person is at and where they're feeling and, and perhaps why that, that there are issues, uncovering them, putting an action plan together. Um, I would say it really depends, without knowing the specifics of the situation, what type of role the person is in. Um, but understanding are there things that you can do to help them help you essentially um coming back to having that increased loyalty and having people fight for your business if they've actually joined you because they believe in you as a founder they believe in you as a business and a vision i think understanding together this is temporary um i think we, we've discussed we're moving out of it now so thankfully things are on the right side of the curve um but other things between now and the end of the year for example that this person could do to, to help them be better engaged or be be better skillfully um i think something i, I mentioned or i wrote down was is there a particular project that this person can work on um if they're in let's say custom success role or maybe they're a finance manager um do you have projects with key clients at the moment that typically this person wouldn't have had exposure to in the past can you give them more responsibility? Can you give them more incentive to be in a client-facing role if that's something they want to develop over the long term? Um, if they're an engineer, for example, can you give them time to work on new projects that might not generate revenue for the business, but it, it could be an idea that could essentially come out of something or, or something could come out of it in the future? Um, or let's say as engineers, do they have personal projects that they've been meaning to do for so long The work commitments, commitments have prevented them doing that? Can you give them a couple of hours a day to, to work on their own project? Is that going to help incentivize them to be better when they're working for you? Uh, and I think be more productive in that respect. Um, so I'd say sort of, I think uh, maybe this is because I would engage a lot more in that respect as well, is having something interesting to do, something that I believe in that, that I could take on. And, and I feel that whilst the situation is, is not great, uh, at least having that chance to upskill, to learn something that I wouldn't normally be able to do in normal time, would they benefit from, from that extra exposure? And, and essentially, they're going to be more valuable to you as a business person in the future anyway, if they're, they're more skilled for the same salary. All right, thanks for the sharing. Uh, is there any more questions from the audience? Okay. So if, okay, we have one question coming in. With the volatile market, what, how would one know uh, what is the normal salary be like? You know, what are the ways that you know someone can find out uh, what is the market rate? Uh, definitely a very interesting question. Uh, I'm probably going to go very consulting focus and say it depends again. Um, uh, there's a lot of changing circumstances that dictate what is the right salary. Um, I think that the easiest way to, to, to do it is... You can look at some of the high street recruitment companies' salary 
surveys that they release year on year. Um, it gives you a rough expectation, but I also think having uh, understood and been around them a little bit in the past that they're, they're quite broad anyway. They give you a high, a mid and a low point of, of ranges anyway, based on experience and skill set. Um, and it can vary so much anyway. Are, are they really worthwhile? Um, I think understanding what the right salary is, is taking into consideration a lot of factors, I think. Um, obviously, what you're prepared to pay as a business owner is, is probably the key factor. Um, there's no point saying, well, the market rate for a driver engineer in a particular city is, is twice as much as you're willing to pay. It might be the market rate, but if you can't pay it, then, then it's not the right salary for you. Um, it's understanding, I think, what you really need from a person, um, how flexible you might be as well. So, so if you're saying, what is your, your skill set, I guess, look at what you need from a role. Um, I guess taking into, into account, maybe say, a, an example, a, a software engineer, how many years of experience are they having after university? What industry experience is it? Is it obviously relevant to your industry? Um, what technologies are they working on? Is it just one technology? Are they able to code in several languages? Um, how are they managing people? How are they project management? Is it new technologies, old technologies? Um, I think if, if you didn't have a starting point, um, one thing you could do is look at some job sites. Uh, I guess a bit of research is of seeing companies that are in your industry that maybe your competitors or similar businesses, what are they advertising jobs for on the respective job sites? Um, I think if we look at Singapore as an example, I think LinkedIn is definitely not the best one because it doesn't necessarily disclose salary details, but things like Indeed, uh, JobsDB, JobStreets, uh, I know down in Australia, like Seek, for example, uh, Monster is quite big globally. They typically have salary ranges on, um, so you can kind of see what other companies are advertising similar roles at, uh, again, based on experience and skill set. That's a good way to see, I think, if you're within the ballpark of what you, you're prepared to pay versus what skills are available. Um, it's probably the easiest way to dictate whether you're right or wrong. Um, the second option would be sort of just working with uh, with a consultant. Uh, I think have a conversation and say, well, do you have salary data or, or can we do a small project where we talk to, to 50 people in the industry in your particular location? Um, and again, for example, are you hiring a developer in, in Vietnam, in, in Ho Chi Minh, or is it going to be in Hong Kong? The salary is very greatly for the same skill set. Um, so I think understanding the, 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 the metrics of what you need to hire having someone that's on the ground or got access to people on the ground to have a quick conversation. So, okay, let, let's speak with 20 people. Let's take a, just a quick consensus of what are you drawing at the moment? What are your expectations, expected salary? Uh, and then discuss that from that perspective. That probably give you a good, uh, a good ballpark. Um, but of course it varies from, from person to person as well. I hope that answers. Is that, uh, is that okay? Maybe we can I can comment and, and if there's any extra to add on to, <laughs> yeah. I, I, or, uh, uh, really, uh, maybe the QR codes. Sorry. Yeah, yeah, quick. Probably I I talk to my boss. Yeah, to, to probably to get some adjustment or so. <laughs> <laughs> That's always uh, always a plan. All right. So another question is actually quite related to that previous question. Uh, is regarding where where can they? What is the best resources for businesses who want to dive? deeper and understand more about you know business expansion in general what kind of resources or materials that they should you know look at in order to prepare for that uh so sorry uh this question is for both of us or yeah anyone oh okay uh pro probably uh okay uh Craig, you have a drink first okay <laughs> let me take a step on this uh okay uh i i think i think during this pandemic a lot of uh universities actually uh offer uh, free online courses. I, I think that's fantastic. Uh, nothing against them. Uh, but uh, I, I rather answer this question in, in, in a more uh, pragmatic way. Uh, I, I see it this way is that uh, if there are a lot of free courses, uh, especially all offered by universities and everything, uh, the choices are a lot of wide and you know, wide and deep and everything. Uh, but uh, the problem is that uh, because it's free, so some of us will probably you know, just try to take as many as possible and uh, you ended up, you, you, you get yourself burnt out. If the objective is actually just to earn the certificates and everything, you know, you know uh, get, get some get some confirmations or whatever for your next job, then I would say get a proper one. Okay, get a proper one, meaning that you are not just there to get a certificate, but to really understand and to really be able to interact. And especially if you are doing an online, meaning that uh, you have a huge community that you can actually interact with. 
So, uh, so, so, so the best is uh, look for who who is the one who actually deliver such kind of uh, materials, such kind of resources. I mean, uh, like Harvard, uh, HBR is actually fantastic. Uh, there are a few others also that's really good. Uh, but uh, there is a huge differentiation between those that are free one and uh, those that are paid one. So some universities or even some uh, educational in institutions, they offer it for free for a limited period of time. Uh, my take is that uh, probably don't be penny wise and pound foolish uh, because it's actually not very expensive to, to be honest. Uh, unless of course you're talk talking about taking a master or taking a, a degree or whatever. But uh, if it's uh, just for really skill set, skill sets, I would rather say go for those uh, that you can afford, but yet at the same time, look for practical advice, look for practical executions and uh, not so much on the theory. Unless you are talking about someone that you have been, you know, let's say for example, you are a mid-level ma manager. So uh, you, you, you have a lot of experience on the executions, but uh, somehow, somewhere, you may want to you know, dive in a bit deeper as, a, as a, the question asked, uh, dive in a bit deeper, then probably you want to go back you know, to look into some theory. So that, that, that may actually complement it both very well that you have a un better understanding of uh, the, the things that you've done and the executions and, and then you have theories and all these and uh, probably even the, some of the case studies that you can refer to. Okay. But uh, that, is, that is probably uh, slightly more rare uh, because uh, the rest of us will probably be more of like, hey, you know, especially those that are in between jobs or maybe you know, uh, your business owners and uh, you, 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 you may not have as much time Okay, because uh, you're, you're probably focusing on running the business and every, you know, having a lot of things to attend everything. So my take here is that go for those as concise. Okay, uh, concise in the sense that uh, you know, when you want to learn something new, you want to dive in a bit deeper, then it's probably you want to talk to someone who had actually uh, much more experience and then they share with you. Sometimes it's better to just you know, talk to someone who has an expert who, 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 who actually understand the market industry much better so having a short conversation to him is definitely still much better than you are trying to spend time trying to find out uh, which is the free materials, which are the one that's available on the YouTube. So sometimes paying a bit of money and then uh, you can really get a lot more and then talk to someone who is actually uh, practicing it. Then you can probably gain the kind of experience, uh, at least in theory or at least virtually, uh, and, and it helps you to, 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 to have a better thought process, a, 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 a slightly clearer, the kind of clarity that you probably may not have when you're running day to day. I, I think this actually will allow you to uh, have a better understanding so that why? There's a very likelihood, I mean, this is coming, uh, entering into uh, Crick's uh, area. Like, you no, know, for all you know, in the next generation of uh, businesses, uh, next generation of companies, the kind of things that they, the kind of people that they'll be hiring may not just be based on the traditional way. It could have actually evolved over this short six months or, or, or even nine months or even 12 months. I mean, I, I, I don't know. I mean, I'm not a HR expert here, but uh, I, I, I guess uh, probably Craig can actually fill in a bit more on that. Yeah, definitely. I mean, things are changing so rapidly. Uh, I think if you look at the clients we work with as well, the tech industry, there's so many roles that, that weren't available five years ago that are available right now. Um, uh, and even, like you said, some products and roles that were not available even 12 months ago are now popping up as well. Um, so yeah, things are changing quickly. Um, the best way, I think, building on what Paddy mentioned, that, that there's definitely academic resources to look at and uh, a wealth of information on the internet. Um, whilst it's laborious, you can start to form your opinions on, on what you look at. Um, another thing I would consider is, is really looking at the mentor. Um, do you have a mentor already? Can you get a mentor that, that sort of, I think, uh, forgive me, Paddy, on this, but uh, people like yourself that have been through several crises in the past, um, that they've weathered the various storms. Uh, they'll have some advice. I think they were, if you think 10, 15 years ago in, in a situation maybe where you're at right now, what did they do and how did they get to where they are? Um, whilst the situations are not identical, uh, whether in a crisis, I guess the, the the process to go through to deal with it is similar. Um, so really, I think leveraging off, off, off seniors in your industry or, or in your network that have been there and what can they provide and how can they help you based on their own personal experiences. Um, I think that's giving you something that's quite, I guess, quite tailored and more specific than what generic information you're finding off the internet. 
Right. Thanks for sharing. Uh, okay, I think we have we are running out of time, so I will do a wrap up right now. All right. So this is our next event. Our next event will be on data protection officer requirement, uh, which is a mandatory uh requirement, you know, for all Singapore registered company. So join us to find out more, like how can you address the recent uh, email that you actually received from our government agency regarding DPO. Uh, so you may register by scanning the QR code over there. Okay, so we will drop you an email on this, uh, so don't worry. So regarding, in case if you miss out, right, we also provide a complimentary consultation uh, from both you know, Best on Consulting and NAUS International. So you can also sign up by scanning the QR code over here. Okay, thank you once again for joining us today. I'll leave the slide over here uh, for you guys to scan uh, for a few minutes. Okay, thank you. Thanks.